Thank you, Julie, and good morning, good afternoon, colleagues and partners. Thank you for joining us as we come together to close the 2022 Global Protection Forum with the session number 12 of the week and with a very promising discussion on how we can better engage on access issues in order to achieve protection outcomes with a particular focus on the good practices and opportunities to better engage with access working groups. We certainly cannot have such an important discussion without inviting OCHA, who will be represented today by Ms. Sophie Solomon, who is OCHA Global Access Advisor, to provide us with pertinent examples on how OCHA via the access working groups ensure a coordinated approach on access. Following OCHA's global perspectives, we will together deep dive into two field experiences. The first is about access challenges and opportunities in South Sudan, which will be presented by our colleague, Mr. David Hattar, who is UNSCR Roving Protection Officer in South Sudan. And the second uh, experience will be shared by Mr. Ramsey Briant, who is the Senior Protection Cluster Coordinator Officer in Nigeria in the sub-office of Maiduguri. These global and field perspectives will then be complemented by uh, different pers perspectives on non-UN1 by Dr. Ashley Jackson, who is a researcher and author, and is also the co-founder and co-director of the Center on Armed Groups. The presentations will be followed by what I hope will be a very lively discussion during the Q&A session. Last but not least, we will invite Mr. Julien Marnef, head of field operations and support at the Global Protection Cluster to close the webinar as well as the week with some remarks and ideas on the way forward and the sust sustained access that protects according to the GPC. To kick off the discussion, it's my pleasure to pass the floor to Ms. Sophie Solomon. Thank you so much, Sophie, for joining us today and for offering us perspective from your work with OCHA as Global Access Advisor. The, the floor is yours, Sophie. Thanks. Thank you very much, Huda, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today to discuss uh, engaging with Access Working Group. So first of all, uh, what I would like to do is a brief presentation about what are Access Working Groups and where you can find an Access Working Group in the field. So if we can start with the first slide, please. And uh, we will see um, that actually, in most of the contexts where you are working, you should be able to uh, identify a focal point within OCHA with an access working group. We have like access working group in more than 24 countries and you see the map and I will be happy to share more details if colleagues are interested in reaching out to uh, the access working group. And uh, we see that uh, in a certain number of countries, we actually do have protection cluster represented in the humanitarian access working group. Uh, top of our mind, we had like Mali, Nigeria, Somalia, Northeast Syria in Gaziantep and Venezuela, but these are only example. And we know that uh, protection cluster are participating as permanent member or ad hoc participant in the humanitarian access working group in a numerous country. So what is the humanitarian access working group? So it's a forum, it's informal, it's not part of the interagency standing committee structure where we hope to have partners together to facilitate the work of the humanitarian partner on access and just to bring us together in a platform where we can exchange on the analysis of the context, where we can discuss advocacy, where we can discuss like how to move forward uh, in gaining access to a specific area and also trying to design policy on access, on engagement with different stakeholders uh, uh, in, a, in a joint manner. So really the Humanitarian Access Working Group is a platform where we hope that all the people with interesting um, analysis and interesting information on access could be together to discuss access issues. We will see that humanitarian access working group really vary from one country to another. It's really based on like what is the expectation from the humanitarian country team 
Do we want to have um, a group that is more focusing on the analysis on the situation? Do we want to have like a much more operational group that is looking at a very specific area and jointly we're just like combining like strengths and we just like make sure that we can move forward with gaining access to this specific area. But what is interesting in that in all this uh, humanitarian access working group, what we are looking at is a complementarity of skills and expertise. We are looking at people with like um, strong like uh, field support and in this regard like clusters and their implementing partners are really an asset for us in terms of like uh, bringing forward the access conversation. So this is like really in a nutshell, like what are humanitarian access working group? Most of the time they are like reporting to the HCT, but in some contexts they're also reporting to the intercluster. Uh, this is the case, for example, in, uh, in South Sudan. So the humanitarian access working group is present. So just for you to know, like you will have opportunity uh, if you're working as an implementing partner uh, uh, on protection or if you are like uh, a part of a protection cluster, like you will have the opportunity to contribute to the work of uh, the humanitarian access working group. So if we move to the next slide, what we can see is clearly like where uh, you can engage and how can we contribute to having this coordinated approach and bringing a protection lens to uh, the access analysis. So potential for engagement uh, are available at various levels. The first one is in the monitoring, the reporting, an analysis of access constraint. So uh, we are welcoming, of course, the protection lens in terms of like, what are the access constraints protection partners are facing? In which location? Who are the perpetrators of the access constraint? And just like making sure that you're contributing to the analysis. In most of uh, the country offices, we have like a mechanism to monitor and report um, access constraints. So please, uh, make sure like you feed in in this mechanism so that we can also have like a really good analysis of the access issues per sector. And we clearly see that um, each sector has very specific uh, access issues. Some are common to all sectors and some are very specific to uh, some sectors. So please feel free to reach out to access colleagues and making sure that you contribute to that. There is also the potential for engagement in the coordination mechanism. Uh, we always welcome protection members in the access working group, uh, usually represented by the protection cluster. So please, if you're not like contributing to the access working group and you would like to be included, feel free to reach out to OCHA and we will make sure that you can participate in the conversation either as a permanent member or on an ad hoc basis if you want to raise some specific issues. Uh, we also have like access strategies at HCT level. And for us, it's very important that protection uh, is included uh, in our strategy. We definitely want that an access strategy as a protection outcome. And uh, as you know, like as OCHA, we really like uh, are the champion of like cent uh, centrality of protection. So we really want to make sure that protection elements are included in, our, in the strategy. So uh, we would be more than happy to have your contribution. Contribution uh, also in terms of policy development. Some country offices develop joint operating principle, ground rules or engagement with armed group. One of the good practice, uh, for example, in Afghanistan, after the Taliban took over, there was really like a, um, a good effort from the humanitarian community to develop joint operating principle on working um, with the de facto authorities and elements uh, of protection were definitely included in the joint operating principles. So these are like some good practices that we can replicate in, in other contexts. Of course, also in terms of advocacy, in terms of negotiation, uh, it's very important to have protection actors as part of the conversation. And uh, we always welcome to have protection actors as part of the negotiation team. Um, and uh, if we are like preparing for a negotiation on a specific area or with a specific actor, it's very important for us that we have this protection lens as well. And that when we're negotiating, there are like some protection outcome as well. So really different level of engagement. Uh, of course, like we are welcoming uh, protection actors in all these elements and uh, really advocating for, for the contribution. If we're moving to the next slide, um, I wanted to show like a very like uh, 
ex very simple example of like where we can actually have like some kind of specific like protection lens some, uh, or protection analysis. So in most of our country offices now, we are doing uh, access severity mapping and uh, we don't see like really clearly, but I, I would like to explain like what you're seeing. Um, we are doing like a severity mapping where we are identifying like, where do we have like low access constraint, medium access constraint and high access constraint. And what is interesting is that now we're overlaying this with a uh, population in need by sector. So we can clearly have a narrative about, for example, in the context of Iraq in 2020, that out of like 300,000 people living in area with severe access constraint, uh, 200,000 people uh, in need uh, were part of the target of the protection cluster. So we can clearly have like this kind of like key messages where we can emphasize is like which sector is the most impacted by the access constraint, what is the caseload of population in need that we cannot reach because of access constraint and trying to find mitigation measure. So that's one of the good practice, practice in terms of like both analysis and advocacy. And if we move to the next slide, we can see um, a different kind of analysis, which was done in Syria in 2019, 2020, where we were looking at access from a different perspective, not necessarily in terms of like, where do we have access constraints uh, and where do we have access or not access, but more in terms of quality of access. And they were looking at different criteria when they were looking at quality of access, including like our ability to sustain presence, uh, the, the different kind of like partner that were present on the ground. Did we have international, national actors, our ability to conduct like needs assessment or evaluation. And one of their key criteria was around protection. And uh, one of the cr criteria to define the quality of access in Syria was the ability to have access for protection related activities or services. And they had like different subcategories such as the presence of protection actors, the ability to carry out assessment mission, the sustainability of intervention, and the ability to carry out evidence-based advocacy on key protection concern. So there was a strong focus on protection in this analysis of access in Syria that led to like uh, regular reporting on the presence of a uh, protection partner, the number of activity that were conducted, the number of missions, and you see like the infographics on your right. So that was another example on how we can really like include the protection lens to like uh, the access uh, analysis and the work of the access working group. And of course, this requires like a close coordination and collaboration with the protection cluster and its partners. So we have like many more examples where we really like uh, have this conversation with protection actors. Uh, more recently, we have like Ukraine, uh, where OCHA conducted an evacuation of civilians, where we um, really like uh, discuss ahead of the mission with the protection cluster and after the mission with a protection cluster, ensuring that uh, all key elements of protection were included in this uh, mission. We also have like a uh, different uh, humanitarian access working group where we are currently like working on specific analysis uh, on protection. So there are like many more examples, but the key message that I wanted to convey today is that we need your contribution. So please feel free to reach out to uh, OCHA uh, in your respective country offices or at global level to make sure that we can go a bit further actually in this analysis of uh, protection issues and access. And uh, we're looking forward to suggestion as well. So uh, really happy to be here today just to like touch upon like what are the possibilities and uh, looking forward to hearing from all the colleagues about like example from their respective country offices and to the question. Thank you so much. Over to you, Huda. Thank you, Sophie, for sharing with us all these insightful and practical ideas and good practices. We are, as always, very grateful for the strong partnership with OCHA and the invaluable expertise and coordination on access. So. Uh, I would now like to turn to uh, our colleague, uh, David, 
And firstly, thank you, David, for being with us today. And would like to ask you the following questions. How do we better negotiate access using protection risks analysis and leveraging protection outcomes? Especially in, in, in your context, do you think that this, um, this use, uh, trying to better use protection risk analysis in the, in the access analysis in general, is it, does it have any impact and how can we measure the impact of access negotiation on the protection of affected civilians? Over to you, David, thanks. Thank you, Huda, um, and thank you everyone for having me. Um, so these are in fact quite interesting questions, but before I, I dive into them, I'd like to give a little context uh, update on South Sudan. So as we know, South Sudan remains a protection crisis um, where the most critical protection risks have not been have not decreased. This is, of course, despite the fact that we've signed the uh, 2018 revitalized agreement on the resolution of conflict in South Sudan. So if you look at the at all the humanitarian needs overviews, the HNOs, the country reports, and other, other various reports that have been published uh, regarding South Sudan, you'll notice that, on the contrary, armed violence and conflict-related crimes um, against affected populations are ever-increasing. Uh, of course, this also affects humanitarian access. So humanitarian access to essential services, including healthcare, protection, water, sanitation, education, et cetera, is, is quite, remi remains quite a challenge in this uh, complex context. So just to give um, an example, between January and December 2021, uh, 591 reported humanitarian access incidents were recorded. So these range between violence against humanitarian personnel to assets to operational interferences. Uh, in that same year, in 2021, five colleagues, aid workers, lost their lives while delivering humanitarian assistance and services. And a total of 322 aid workers were relocated due to insecurities and threats against their lives or security. Just this past month in September, we've had four colleagues that have unfortunately lost their lives. And we've had 39 incidents uh, where, uh, that have been recorded that almost half of them have had a significant, significant impact on uh, humanitarian operations. So to answer your questions, how can we better negotiate access using protection? So when we talk about the access working group, or when we talk about access negotiations, we need to keep in mind that um, the access working group goes into these negotiations, not having protection in mind. These are people who are, these are security people. These are negotiating nego people who negotiate access. They go into these negotiations looking, how can we get services? How can we get food assistance? How can we get shelter and FIs into an area? Protection is the last thing on their mind. So for people like us who work in protection, obviously protection is the first thing in our, in our mind. So because we, the way we think about it is how, how are we going to talk about food assistance or shelter and FIs if we cannot even guarantee that the person can get to said location? So basically, the protection cluster, in my opinion, uh, needs to bring a narrative that looks at access negotiations beyond food, beyond shelter and FI, beyond political negotiations. Because like I said, if a civilian cannot access the location, there are no safe roads, there are no safe zones, there are no military-free zones, we cannot even begin to talk about assistance or, or protection programming. How are we supposed to talk about GBV, for example, when the soldiers that are committing sexual violence are sitting under the tree opposite the road from where you're, where, when you're doing your protection services? Um, how, are we to, how are we going to talk about food distribution when uh, youth or armed, armed groups are attacking women and children on their way back home with the, with the assistance they've received? So protection is supposed to provide an analysis that security or access personnel don't think about. Um, so I believe the way we can do this is by three things, or at least the way that it's supposed to happen or that we want it to happen in South Sudan is by via three things. First of all, participating in the access working group, which we're doing. Um, second of all, we have the mobile protection working groups and we have the recently launched protection monitoring system. So participating in the access working group, how is that beneficial? So by, by participating in the access working group, we act as a bridge between the access working group and actors. Um, to put it in simple terms, when negotiating access, ideally, what should happen is you have your protection actors who are your first responders, who are people who are already in the field, um, who are people that whenever there is conflict, they're the people who are there who are telling you who attacked, 
what act whom, why did it happen, when did it happen, people who in, in, in other terms are doing your conflict analysis. And you have your access working group who usually negotiate with politicians, with the government, with, with the actors themselves. In any given negotiation uh, or access negotiation, what should happen is protection people should use the people who are in the field, not use, benefit from the people that are working in the field and engage with communities. Obviously here, engaging with communities is key because it's the community leaders, it's the communities who's, who are gonna tell you, this location is safe for us, this location is not, right? So you talk to the community, you engage with the community, you do your risk analysis. And then from that, you come back with plan A, B, C, till whatever letter of the alphabet you wanna, you wanna, you wanna reach. And then you come back to the access working group and you say, right, according to our engagement with the community, um, these are the locations that the community feels safe for us to negotiate access of services to. This is ideally what should happen. And then we try to negotiate. If that doesn't happen, then plan B. If that doesn't happen, then plan C. But what's key here is community engagement and risk analysis. Secondly, by, by being part of the access working group, the cluster is supposed to be like an overarching safeguarding mechanisms. Um, actually, we are currently the only cluster that attends the access working group. So we should represent humanitarian programming. In any given conflict, uh, you will have the access working group will call for a meeting and they will say, we cannot access location A, B, and C. The, the groups that are fighting are this group and this group, and they belong to this political party and this political party or whatever. They, they, they have the, the incomes, right? They, they, have, they know the facts. That's the easy bit. What's difficult is us as a protection fora saying, right, we cannot access A, B, and C. So what is the next best location that is community accepted, that is safe for the community that we could identify? And then what are the protection mechanisms that we could, that we could put in place to ensure that these people make it safe to these locations, receive services, and are able to stay there and stay safe, right? There is an emphasis here that, again, community engagement, it has to be chosen by the community. We cannot... We cannot just say, oh, you have to move across three counties or three villages or three whatever in order to receive services. It has to be chosen by the community. Um, another thing that uh, the protection risk analysis helps us to do is safeguarding our own colleagues. Uh, like I mentioned, unfortunately, only, past, only this past month, we've lost four colleagues. So this risk analysis helps us identify, for example, not only the risks that uh, the affected populations are facing, but also us as, as people who are working in the context. And in the context of South Sudan, for example, um, if you have a conflict and you see that the colleagues on the ground are from ethnicity A or B, and you can the, the risk analysis will tell you, if you're from ethnicity A, you should not be there. Um, or if you are a foreigner, you should not be there stuff like this. So we should be able to say someone from ethnicity A or, or ethnicity B should not go to that area. If this person is going to go and negotiate with government, for example, we as from the protection analysis, we should be able to say who needs to be present in this meeting. And if someone who is a national staff is going to be there, we need to, we need to identify what safeguarding measures we're gonna, put, we're gonna put in place to ensure that the safety of our colleagues. So that's from participating in the access working group side. Uh, then we have the mobile protection working group, which is uh, something that's been uh, functioning in South Sudan for, for a couple of years now. Uh, this is extremely useful for hard to reach areas uh, because we obviously benefit from the experience uh, of our local colleagues who not only are uh, part of the community, but because they're part of the community, there are two benefits. They know better, obviously because you cannot go and negotiate on behalf of a community when, when you don't know what are their needs, how they think, what they want. It's, it's, this is not how it works. Um, and second, they become a channel of a two-way communication with the community. And this is essential with any access negotiations, with any because access at the end of the day is building trust. If you do not build trust, then it's impossible to gain access. This was quite... Uh, Quite, uh, quite visible actually a couple of years back when we had like former Southern unity states. Uh, we had a conflict, well, I wasn't there, but obviously this is like the experience from the colleagues. Um, we had a conflict where no one outside of the state was allowed to enter. Access was extremely difficult. 
And yet the production cluster, the NGO form, which is an amazing production uh, partner, because they they obviously um, represent the will the willingness and the participation of the NGOs, national and international. Uh, we had production actors who were on the ground, who were part of the community. And it was because of these actors who were on the ground, who were part of the community, that we were able to negotiate a couple of missions that were a bit longer, were like four, six, eight weeks missions, where we were able to talk about protection, where we were able to engage with the community, gain their trust. And now we have full-time protection programming. And it was because of this that we were able to do this. So this is one of the success stories that we have with the mobile protection uh, working group. Um, and then finally, we have the protection monitoring system. So the protection monitoring system, I think uh, it's it's the same around, around the globe, but we were able to launch it last month. Uh, we've just received data back. We were quite happy with it. It's not published yet, but basically the protection monitoring system, we believe, is a great tool because it covers 95% of, of South Sudan, and South Sudan is quite big, as most of you know. Um, we've been able to have buy-in from most of the national, international partners in South Sudan, which is how we were able to reach 95% coverage. The idea behind the protection monitoring system is that we want to utilize the data that we're receiving. Uh, and this data, once analyzed, will give us heads up on like potential areas for constraints, but also will give us heads up on where there is a space to negotiate based on these findings. So I think these, these are like the, the pros of, of using protection risk analysis. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, this is really interesting. And you said uh, like a few golden words, I think. Uh, you mentioned uh, import the importance of protection monitoring system and protection risk analysis, the conflict analysis and community engagement. And also you highlighted the role of local staff and local actors and the role of the NGO forums. And I think these are golden keys to, to really support access to affected population and vice versa. They are uh, access to us as well and their feedback to us. So thank you very much, David. And uh, we will now turn to our colleague Ramsey, who is uh, the Senior Protection Cluster Coordinator Officer in Maiduguri in Nigeria. So Ramsey, we, we do understand that the ongoing return and relocation of IDPs is one of the main concerns for the humanitarian community in Nigeria. How has the issue of access affected the sustainable return and the integration of IDPs? Over to you, Ramsey. Uh, thank you, Haula, and uh, good um, afternoon from uh, Nigeria to colleagues online. Uh, and yes, indeed, um, a major protection concern and actually a concern to the entire humanitarian community. Uh, given the fact that uh, the conflict is in its 13th year and uh, we still continue to uh, see a new displacement, uh, insurgency going on, uh, active uh, hostilities between the non-state armed group uh, as well uh, with the government, I mean, with the military of uh, Nigeria. And we think uh, with such a situation, uh, there have been a lot of advocacy with uh, the government to ensure that uh, return is for the delay to the reasons for which uh, IDPs fled uh, uh, their areas of origin uh, no longer exist before return can take this. So right now, um, we, uh, we have a return uh, of IDPs uh, to most uh, local government areas uh, where they come from, but most of them are situated in uh, the local government capitals and are unable to uh, go back to their areas of origin. So, um, we see that um, most of the return areas uh, are still areas that are hard to reach. So you find out that um, most of uh, the returnees are not reaching to their original areas of habitat, but they are remaining going back to IDP camps within uh, uh, the areas where they've been returned. And uh, most of those areas where they originally come from are not accessible to them, are also not accessible to us, humanitarian workers. And most importantly, uh, we have, um, due to the ongoing military uh, hostilities, 
uh, the military dug trenches around the key major towns that prevents, uh, with the purpose of preventing uh, the North State Armed Group members using vehicles penetrating areas controlled by the military. And such a step has led to the IDPs having limited access to farmland. And uh, the population within Northeast Nigeria are predominantly people that are engaged in farming for, for, for livelihood and for income generation. And for the fact that they cannot access farmland uh, due to the perimeter set by the military as to how far you can go, uh, it is a serious access issue and has led to several negative coping mechanisms, thereby resulting to that being a protection concern for us. Even those that are engaged in farming, they are limited as to the kind of crop that you can plant. Uh, they are expected not to plant crops that will grow very high because it may prevent the military from uh, uh, identifying if any non state armed group members is infiltrating their control area. So we, um, we also had an experience where uh, recently, a few months ago, the government uh, uh, instructed uh, humanitarian organizations not to provide humanitarian assistance in areas where uh, IDPs have been relocated to. Uh, with, as, as mentioned by the government, that uh, they feel that uh, the continuation of humanitarian assistance in return area we further hinder the uh, ability of uh, the IDPs to be self-reliant. Uh, so we felt that was a, a, an issue given the fact that most of these areas where these individuals have been returned, they cannot be engaged in any meaningful livelihood activities. Humanitarian actors are also not able to provide sufficient uh, uh, basic support to the needs of these individuals given the fact that we already have a large portion of uh, IDPs that are in need of assistance. We have people fleeing from areas controlled by the non-state armed groups who still need a lot of support. We also have refugees returning from nearby states, I mean, nearby countries, Niger, Cameroon, and Chad. So this situation is compounded and is affecting uh, uh, the assistance that has been provided to the IDPs. Uh, we also have um, another access related issue that has protection implications. Uh, with the uh, explosive remnants of war, uh, we have a situation where the demining action taken by the military is for two uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is if there is military advances uh, targeting non-state armed groups, there is demining activity that is taking place, and also for humanitarian convoy. But when it comes to uh, areas of return, we haven't seen much action taken by the government to ensure that. Uh, areas of return are demined before relocation take place. So we've had a lot of incidences where um, uh, IDPs and our returnees have been exposed to IEDs. We've had children killed. And most of these individuals, given that they cannot engage in farming, they go around searching for metal crops to be used for income generation. So children may not understand what is an unexplosive ordnance material and what is a toy. So we've had situations where children playing in the field were, were killed because, uh, uh, because of uh, unexplosive uh, or, or remnants of war within uh, the communities. We also have um, uh, an issue of uh, housing, land, and property uh, where individuals are unable to access these uh, house, their housing, their land, and their property. And these are just some of the factors that uh, exemplify the need for consistent collaboration between access and protection. Thank you, Hoda. Thank you, Ramsey. I have a, a follow-up question to you, actually. Uh, like you mentioned, many, many challenges regarding uh, explosive ordinance, remnants, uh, uh, of um, explode, an exploded ordinance as well. And, uh, and the fact that the assistance and the engagement with non-state armed groups, the fact that you only engage with non-state armed groups, I know in Nigeria can be criminalized. So uh, uh, faced with all these challenges, how have the access working group and the protection sector worked together to address issues related to lack of access and protection of the population? Over to you, Ramsey. Thank you, Hauda. Um, in practical terms, uh, there are several overlapping uh, issues uh, that comes in play when you talk about access and protection. And in Nigeria, our work with uh, the Access Working Group has been also done in close collaboration with the same court, uh, given the fact that uh, most of what we do is to be is based on negotiation with uh, the Nigerian military. And like you mentioned, uh, 
negotiation or engagement with the non-state armed groups uh, in Nigeria is considered uh, illegal, uh, given the fact that their perception that um, if you engage in non-state armed groups, you're going to be supporting their legitimacy. And uh, the government of Nigeria doesn't want to see any negotiation or engagement with non-state armed group members. So most of our access and same core discussion is done primarily with the Nigerian military. And for this, we depend on uh, the access and same core working group that is led by OCHA and us as being with the NGO Forum and the OCHA as well. Uh, it is important to note that um, when you're talking access, the only way many people get to understand the implication if they understand the protection risk. If you're talking about population having access, they do, they do not have access to farmland. How will a little man or someone within the government that doesn't have a protection sense understand the, uh, the implication of that? So in order for access to be uh, to make a greater impact, it has to be linked to the protection risk associated with the lack of access. So this is where we have a lot of uh, collaboration uh, with uh, the access and same core working group to jointly identify access issues, attach that to, to the protection risk, and then present to the relevant stakeholders. So we have Joint position paper, we have our regular meetings with the access working group to highlight key issues. We've even created a WhatsApp group for the access, same court, and protection working group, where we commonly share information, discussions, and prepare for advocacy, for example. In locations that are inaccessible, uh, what we do, because protection has community-based structures, community groups that are established in most of the local government areas, we use this community structures to provide information. Good, you're back. Go ahead. Yeah, so we, in locations where we have, we do not have access or areas that are hard to reach, the, the uh, NGOs in the UN have policies that prevent them from going to hard to reach and inaccessible areas. But uh, those policies do not apply to community-based groups. So we use the community-based structures that protection has to on the to have like information access issue protection issues from the field that can be transmitted to the access uh, colleague to the sync out colleagues and um, uh, for easier advocacy for example we also have um, regular meetings with the military to discuss access related issues as well as protection issues some concrete examples we've had was uh, uh, the situation where we had the military uh, occupying schools for example we we had a discussion with the access and same core working group. We came up and identified the various schools the military are occupying. Our children do not have access to education, the protection implication of that. So basically we've had several collaborations. We've even had situations where we uh, call on actually two weeks ago, where we mobilized uh, protection actors in the field to understand access related issues, simple related issues. How do they engage the military in the field when they have protection concerns, given the fact that they are on the front line. So how do they engage the military is important uh, to understand the difference between access, same core related issues and protection issues. Um, we've had a lot of capacity building uh, activities. We develop our request for information, the RFR tracking system uh, that we work on with, along with the assets and same called police to be tracking the uh, information that we, we ask of the military. So basically, and right now we are actually discussing uh, a joint briefing session for donors to be held by the assets as well as the protection sector. So basically, these are some of the initiatives we've undertaken along with the assets, assets working group. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Ramsey. This was an excellent presentation. And uh, I think it's time to turn now to our special guest who will provide us with a non-UN perspective. I turn to Dr. Ashley uh, about how these challenges have changed over time and how or whether protection responses have also changed. Over to you, Dr. Ashley. Thank you, Huda. Um, so I think I have a presentation that's just about to pop up, but just in terms of background, um, 
One of the things that I was asked to talk about was a study I co-authored with Steve Zick called Presence and Proximity. It was about all of the challenges we've talked about today. Um, it came out in 2017, so I'll talk a little bit about that study. It was co-sponsored by OCHA and NRC, and we spent really six months, Steve and I, traveling from Central African Republic to Iraq to a number of contexts, interviewing humanitarians and communities and trying to understand the state of access and protection. This study, this presence and proximity study, followed up on another study which had been done five years prior to that called To Stay and Deliver. And that was really a reaction to the post 9-11 bunkerization of aid agencies um, that we saw. So it feels somehow appropriate five years on from this presence and proximity study to be sitting here with all of you trying to revisit some of those findings specifically in relation to protection and issues of coordination and, and the ones that we've been talking about today. Um, so that's a little bit of background. My specialty, although I began my career as a, as a humanitarian aid worker, is negotiating with armed groups and trying to understand engagement with armed groups. So I'm going to touch on all of that in, in my remarks and really trying to respond to some of the things that uh, Sophie Ramsey and David also brought up. Um, so the question that we can move on to the, the first slide, um, but the question of proximity and presence for humanitarians and is an enduring one with the main dilemma being around getting access to populations or at least ensuring populations have access to assistance and protection, but also ensuring that protection is not forgotten in that equation, that it is not mainstreamed out of existence, that it is, is part of an access approach. And that's difficult. That's incredibly difficult in the highly fluid and challenging and violent environments in which humanitarians work today. What we found in this report, and it's, it will be no news to anyone listening, is that presence and by extension access was clearly linked to protection, that you know, protection requires this kind of access and should be an integral part of any access approach. I think we've come a long way in terms of incorporating that into access negotiations, into the cluster system, into working groups as Sophie touched on. Um, but there's still a lot of challenges and there's still a lot of preconceived notions around access being first and protection being a secondary concern. But as Ramazi talked about, um, often access and protection are so deeply intertwined that if you don't address them holistically as part of the same approach, you're not gonna be able to meet humanitarian needs in a sustainable way. You risk marginalizing already vulnerable and marginalized populations. You risk creating uh, new conflicts or exacerbating old ones. And we found in context after context that there were both really great approaches to doing just that, despite the issues around coordination, but also, again, this mindset of of um, not being able to do all of that. And in a lot of these contexts that we looked at from Iraq to Syria, agencies were not directly present. They were subcontracting, they were uh, monitoring remotely, they were using community-based organizations in a way that it became very difficult to understand the risks on the ground uh, and to program effectively for that. There were many kind of layers of subcontracting, but not a lot of coordination and information sharing as we've been talking about today. Um, the kinds of tactics and techniques of using community-based organizations in the example of Nigeria, that's a good practice. We found a lot of challenges to establishing that kind of good practice. Um, and we also found that where agencies struggled to be present in an area, they tended to ignore protection simply because those concerns, those issues are much more nuanced. They're much more difficult to detect. You need that on the ground insight. David talked about this as well in South Sudan. And it, if you're not physically there talking to populations, understanding what different people in different communities need and where the threats are coming from, it becomes, again, very hard to address as opposed to meeting food needs through food distribution, something which feels um, more straightforward, although there are of course complexities there as well. 
a final point, which we've we've touched on a little bit, but not much, is that when it comes to armed groups and protection concerns, whether they're state aligned militias or non-state armed groups who exist in opposition opposition to each other or to the state, private direct advocacy is incredibly important. Being able to talk to belligerents on all sides is incredibly important in terms of the long game of socializing and furthering protection and human rights concerns. You have to engage and you have to have that, that kind of presence. Now, because this is often done best directly, um, you, you need that presence. Of course, ad hoc negotiations for access through or through community acceptance and directly may be the only way of working in a certain context, but there are of course um, sacrifices and you don't necessarily have those kinds of sustained advocacy strategies, either because the armed group is seen as quote unquote off limits or unreceptive, um, or people simply don't know where to begin because they've been in this posture of, of not talking to or not being present directly in those areas where armed groups are. That is not to say that community links aren't important or that the community cannot provide um, important um, advocacy or information or support approaches to protection. David talked about this with South Sudan, uh, specifically with regard to unity state, right? Um, and as Ramsey was talking about with regard to Nigeria, sometimes the challenges of, of any direct engagement or any advocacy to the non-state actor side are, are to are seem insurmountable in the current context. But one of the things that we express concern about in this report and which I remain concerned about is that those strategies of protection, that element of protection, that engagement with non-state actors often falls by the wayside, um, particularly since 9-11, since we have the kinds of counter-terror restrictions uh, and other restrictions which make that very difficult. So if we move to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about what, what I think has changed um, and hopefully that sets us up for, for a bit of a debate. Well, a lot and a very little at the same time has changed. Um, there are new conflicts, new dynamics, new actors, which I'll come to in a second. But then is now, you know, whether or not there's protection as part of an access mindset, it's incredibly uneven. It depends on a mix of external and internal dynamics, politics, personalities, perceptions, um, who the head of a certain mission is even can, can affect whether or not an agency is able to establish presence or able to find a modality to work on these concerns. And all of these are dynamic and shape the degree to which one can kind of stay and deliver and have this approach. One striking change is in places like Somalia where you know, four or five years ago, there was a much more forward-leaning risk posture, much more political willingness to kind of um, take risks to be able to have a holistic approach to access and protection, to try and push back out into areas to find ways to negotiate with armed groups. It's the exact opposite today. I think we're seeing some 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 change in posture with with the famine, trying to get back out, trying to get into areas controlled by Al-Shabaab and things like this. But there's been a huge sea change, which doesn't necessarily have to do only with the conflict dynamics, but has to do with other internal dynamics that are inside the humanitarian community, inside the UN family, inside those coordination structures and things like that. Um, and the, the issue, and we see it again in places like Somalia so severely, is that the consequences of, of not pushing forward, of not having those modalities, is that when there's a famine like what we're experiencing now or near famine-like conditions in many areas, the inability to reach those populations who are suffering is it, they're the ones who, who pay the price for that. Um, there are also new challenges as well and that, that can't be underestimated. The word new is kind of tricky, of course. I think there are probably new variants to old challenges and I'll explain what I mean in a second. Um, so one is working with kind of stronger authorities or strong states who are suspicious of and seeking to control aid and access, 
who don't want the kinds of negotiations with armed groups, amongst other things, don't want certain protection concerns talked about or addressed, would rather that you just give them the aid and um, leave it at that. The conflict in Ethiopia is one, the deadliest conflict in the world right now, um, where I think agencies are really struggling with some of these issues, and one where protection concerns exist in a very complicated and often compromised relationship to principled access. Um, but I could go on, I could think about the Houthis in Yemen, the Taliban de facto government in Afghanistan and so on. But we're also seeing different types of groups. Uh, so in Central African Republic, we know for example, that the Wagner group has been responsible for more violent targeting of civilians since 2020 than either state forces or the main opposition forces. And how do you engage with the Wagner group? Well, I think that's an issue that a lot of agencies are debating and incredibly worried about and frustrated by because it's quite frankly not very easy. In places like Haiti, uh, gangs or other actors that don't quite fit into our typology of, of armed groups or the old ideas of the armed groups we should be negotiating and dealing with uh, are posing severe access challenges. I say again that these are new variants because um, these kinds of dynamics have been around in Haiti and elsewhere for a very long time. Militias and mercenaries like the Wagner Group are probably as old as war itself. Uh, and criminal groups and gangs are nothing new, but they're existing at a scale and with regard to protection challenges and access challenges that I don't think we've seen before. The nature, the mutation, if, if I can carry the COVID uh, <laughs> uh, metaphor along, uh, has, has changed and is an important thing to consider. You know, our our coordination mechanisms are our ways of working fit for purpose with regard to those contexts. Um, the report itself went into lots of things around self-generated risks and things around the nature of remoteness and remote programming. I'll probably skip that, but my, my underlying conclusion is that if we're talking about access that protects um, and that protects everyone, uh, that's still not a common mindset or approach. And it, a lot of the knowledge sits in forums like this one. It doesn't always trickle down. It's at the mercy of these larger uh, dynamics. But I think as the speakers have illustrated today, we've made a great deal of progress. And one of the ways in which we've made progress is in working together. Um, and this is where I come back to access working groups. Um, you know, what our report and what my entire body of work on humanitarian action has underscored is that Humanitarian actors are most effective in creating change for themselves and for the people they're trying to serve when they can find ways to effectively work together. This means sharing experiences, especially in high-risk environments where agencies are fearful of talking about the real compromises of access and protection, where they might be in competition with one another within the UN or for funding or for presence. People like to capture their areas and say that this is where we're working, et cetera, and don't necessarily want to share challenges that an agency also working there might be facing as well. Demands for taxes, protection concerns, diversion, all those kinds of things are often kept quiet unless we have forums and modalities to talk with one another. Because of course, there are huge individual legal organizational risks to a lot of the protection challenges and the things that we've talked about today. Um, so what Sophie was talking about at the outset, all of this only works if we have collective participation in the forums that are there. And those forums actually work to create tools like joint operating principles that are responsive to what agencies are actually grappling with. Do the principles make sense? Is it safe to talk about these challenges in those fora? I think again, with modalities like access working groups, but also things like um, security uh, consortia and collectives, like INSO, like country level fora that exist to, to coordinate national and international NGOs, we have really come a long way. But I think it's important to also be honest about the challenges and how they kind of reemerge, um, rematerialize in, in these sort of new variants and ask ourselves very hard questions about, okay, you know, country to country based on personalities, politics, the winds of change, are these modalities for working together actually fit for purpose? Um, but I'll leave it there and, and hand it back to you, Huda. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Ashley. Uh, actually, it's a, it's a very good transition to the Q&A session since it's uh, it's really open our eyes and uh, provide us with the uh, external also uh, points of view from the UN centric approach it's very important to 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 work together in order to to address all these challenges and um, uh, colleagues, I invite you to post your questions or to uh, raise your hand if you have any direct question to our panelists. But I will uh, already received a few questions, uh, and I will start with the straightforward one to to Ocha. And I think it's uh, for Sophie. It will be very easy for you to explain that since you are leading as Ocha both the access working groups and the same coordination working groups. And the question is about the collaboration and overlaps. Uh, colleagues are asking, how can uh, we work uh, with both working groups when they do exist together? And what is the difference uh, in, in one context when we only have one of these two uh, platform? Is there any difference? Are there any complementarities? Over to you, Sophie. Thank you very much. And indeed, it's a very good question and how to avoid duplication. And I think like a lot of colleagues in the field experience like multiple like forum of coordination. So the civil military coordination working group is really focusing on engagement with armed actors. Uh, and mostly uh, like uh, I would say like military actors. So what we're seeing usually is an information sharing and a dialogue between like the humanitarian community and the military actors and see how we can make sure that there is uh, no compromise on the humanitarian principle and making sure that there is a clear distinction between like a humanitarian and military actors. So usually in this forum, you would find like military actors, peacekeeping uh, operation would be represented. So it's really like about like this kind of coexistence of humanitarian actors and military actors. When we're looking at the access working group, it's much more like a humanitarian forum. And the idea is really to have like different skills and expertise. So in the access working group, and it would vary from one country to another, but usually we would have like an expert on advocacy, we would have like the protection cluster, we would bring some uh, colleagues from the logistic cluster, we would bring some colleagues from uh, security and UNDSS or INSO. So it's a very different platform in a way that it's more kind of coordination among humanitarian actors to decide on how we should work together, having a common voice, a common approach to gain and sustain access to a specific area. So I would say that the humanitarian access working group is a more kind of like humanitarian platform. The SIMCORD working group is a more a platform of dialogue between military actors and humanitarian actors. So that's how I would um, make the difference. There is a complementarity, and usually in OCHA, it's the same person who is at the same time the access person and the SIM card person. So uh, in this case, like the OCHA person would also bring like the information that are like shared in the civil military coordination working group into the access working group as one element of information on how to gain access. But that would be like, uh, I, I would say like civil military coordination support access and uh, access is using like all kind of channel and information that are, are available to have this really like big picture on how to gain and sustain access. Very clear, thank you very much, Sophie. Uh, there is also a question to David about the, the work when you mentioned that we sometimes rely or many times rely uh, on uh, local national staff and local actors uh, when we uh, negotiate access because they know more the, the context and they have this connection with the community. But the question is, uh, is the following. Don't you think that relying on local uh, staff and local actors is a way of transferring the risk as well? Over to you, David. And Ramsey, feel free to compliment. Thank you. Thank you, Huda, and thank you for whoever posted that question. I think there's there's always a, a degree of risk, but obviously the, the whole purpose of conducting a protection risk analysis is that we try and limit the transference of this risk, right? So like I mentioned, I gave the example of Southern Unity, um, former Southern Unity, sorry. 
Um, the idea of the protection risk analysis is that we talk to local partners. These are people that are already there. We're not asking someone to go on our behalf. We are asking people who are already part of the community and we are telling them, right, so what do you think should happen? Uh, I think the key message here is always community engagement is always asking the community for what they think is best. Is there a risk of transmitting, is, is there like a possibility of transmitting risk? Definitely. But the idea of a protection risk analysis is to limit it as much as possible. This is this is my opinion, at least. I don't know if anyone else disagrees. Thank you. I don't know if Ramsey you want to complement, and I, I link that to another question in the chat uh, about how uh, can the can we work concretely on localization if it's not a way of working for humanitarians, it's not part of our uh, uh, modus operandi uh, concretely. Over to you, Ramsey. Uh, thank you. Um, in Nigeria, and like many humanitarian uh, operations, a significant portion of the frontline agencies and those implementing protection consists of uh, national NGOs. So for the protection sector, we are keen on uh, ensuring that um, capacity building are provided to national NGOs. And I see one of the question in the chat box was uh, supporting national NGOs as far as uh, do no support is concerned. And uh, we understand that uh, the challenges some donors face with uh, ensuring that our localization strategy is implemented is uh, uh, the vetting process, the, the procedures, the check and balances, uh, the relevant standards that uh, some donors would expect of a national NGO. So what we've done, uh, like for example, the recent allocation of uh, the Nigerian Humanitarian Fund, uh, the NHF, we try as much as possible to see how the local NGOs that qualify for funding can be supported. If they do not meet the relevant criteria set by OCHA, how can the international NGOs and the UN ensure that uh, there is this consortium approach where national NGOs are also uh, considered when it comes to funding allocation? So the localization can only be achieved if the capacity of these national NGOs are built. Because if you want to have a solid project implementation, first you need to have the required staffing. And uh, to have staffing, you need budget. So if uh, we can outsource funding possibility for local NGOs, it helps to ensure that uh, the localization is materialized. And uh, we've tried as much as possible to see how we can organize donor meetings. We've had some of them organized before, and we are trying to see how we can take donors from Abuja, capital city, to visit locations where the, the national NGOs can have direct engagement with donors to see what they are doing. Probably that can influence uh, their funding possibility for local NGOs. Thank you. Thank you, Ramsey. Any reaction from Sophie or Ashley before uh, giving the floor to... Uh to colleagues who uh, raised their hand. And I will ask uh, Julie and uh, colleagues who are supporting technically to unmute Lily, maybe we start with Lily. Thank you so much given this chance. So I am from Myanmar. Let me know one thing, so uh, related protections, or oh, especially in the, in the Myanmar have the more, uh, many of the minority growth or oh, or oh, my marginalized, or oh, especially the Rohingya community. Uh, I I would like to know, especially one thing uh, in the any any approach, uh, community approach. At the times the the most uh, group uh, group of community, uh, they are still happening still less. At the time, how to engage with them? And because of they are not the officials uh, financial policy because uh, 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 th that group can't uh, register it or to receive the financials. Uh, or how can to handle that uh, that group to get uh, protection uh, fully uh, fully and the or the uh, th that's once once uh, one another one is the how to promote uh, the uh, yeah, that's community or a technical or a, a protections get-ins. I hope you will get my point. I would like to know, is there any example of or, or in the other countries or, or in the, 
that's minority group what, what uh, how to overcome this issue uh, to get the uh, to be uh, to get the citizenship rights and the other human rights or uh, uh, international human human rights law uh, human rights and international humanitarian right law under the coverage Thank you, thank you, Mang. I, I hope that I understood uh, the question, but I understand it's uh, uh, beyond also the access, but it's about access issues for minorities as well and how we can uh, uh, defend that and find ways to uh, advocate for that, if I understood well. Um, any uh, Anyone? Um, Ashley, maybe uh, if you manage to... Uh, cover a little bit the issues related to access for particular groups, vulnerable groups, especially minorities. Over to you. Yeah, I think this is a very difficult one. Um, certainly when we were doing the last study, um, yeah, Rakhine and the Rohingya was one issue that humanitarians were at that point beginning to grapple with. And that's of course, one of the issues where I think we've seen that there's when you're encountering such an enormous kind of blockage politically, it's very difficult for humanitarians to, to overcome because it's no longer a humanitarian issue. It's, it's a political issue. Um, and then humanitarians are very much caught in the middle. But then of course, there are other things and I think someone else touched on housing, land and property um, protection efforts to get people documentation. In Afghanistan, for example, this was a helpful success story, getting women ID cards, getting women deeds to land that they had inherited, um, but didn't have the paperwork, didn't know how to get the paperwork, didn't know how to get all of the, the things in order. So I think there, where, where the context is politically open enough, it is possible to, to design these approaches which cater to different parts of the, the population. There are so many more examples we can think of, I guess. But it, again, I think it also comes down to how much can humanitarians overcome the, po the political and conflict-related barriers? Because often minority populations are targeted. They are the terrain of the conflict in a way. Um, so I think that's one, one salient point where I think you run into these blockages and we haven't always come up with solutions for them. Uh, but I'll hand it back to you, to you, to to others in the panel for for better examples on that front. Thank you. I I don't know if uh, colleagues would like to add anything because we have uh, we received uh, many other questions in the chat and we have still uh, Lily waiting, but she couldn't I think unmute herself. So I will give the floor to Diane if uh, Diane can unmute herself. If, yes, Hello? Yes. yes, we hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this discussion. Uh, I think I will go in French. It will be more easy for me. So, um, oh. and Diane Felicité, what is so, the My question? name is Diane Felicité. Felicité. And I'm working on a question question about equality of genders and inclusion. Alors, le sentiment que j'ai souvent eu, c'est so que c'est quelque chose qui n'est pas feeling that it's something uh, 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 that doesn't seem to be urgent. On dirait qu'il y a toujours des choses très importantes. We always have the feeling there are many things that uh, are many important things and priorities. So what I would want to know is the question is for those of them, uh, most notably for the, for the lady from Ocha. So is this something relevant if we group Est-ce qu'on a des exemples Do we have a clear dans examples? certains pays Est-ce qu'il y a des pays qui ont travaillé par rapport à cette question Have you uh, worked accept? on the equality? Quelques, Any, could you share avec some examples with us? I think it would be a, a good thing to, to highlight what you're doing and how you're working on these topics. Personne qui travaille sur les questions d'égalité déjà, quel conseil As someone who's working on the equality of the internet, what which kind of advice could you give us in order to, uh, uh, to work on a permanent basis with the, the work in the group? So, Alors y a des questions plus pertinentes de so maybe uh, as we have, uh, we're discussing, but we have a very uh, important and relevant uh, topics that need to be addressed. 
speaks French, she understands French, but the, the two questions were about access and gender equality, and the other one on how to integrate access working groups by uh, local actors without uh, feeling that they are just bothering or uh, adding um, any, any weight. So, Sophie, over to you. No, thank you very much, uh, Diane, for the question, because I think indeed it is a gap uh, and we need to do more to include like gender elements in the uh, access working group and the access analysis overall. What we do see is that in some context, uh, gender is taken into account. And I would like to share maybe like two examples where we do have like a, a gender analysis when it comes to access constraint. The first one is Afghanistan where Afghanistan is tracking really like access issues that are really specific to women and uh, women access to assistance, access to health, but also like, uh, like women uh, gender related access constraint where we see, for example, female worker not being able to have um, uh, movement clearance. So we clearly have like on a monthly basis, a snapshot that reflects on all these gender related uh, access constraints. So this is one of the good example. And uh, we hope that this could be replicated in other contexts. We have other example like in Yemen, where we're looking at lo also all the uh, access constraints related to Maram, and the obligation for uh, female staff to be accompanied by a man to go through certain checkpoints. And this is reflected also in the uh, access analysis. This being said, uh, this gender lens is really like uh, a minority, I would say, in the access working group. So thanks for raising this issue. I think uh, we would welcome uh, definitely like more uh, access, uh, uh, access and gender elements in our analysis. We also see like in some context, like for example, men of fighting age, they don't have the same access as uh, other civilian to assistance because they are worried that they would be arrested on their way to a distribution or like that they will be uh, targeted and protection concerns. So we do not necessarily like collect this information. So in your context, I would definitely encourage you to reach out to the chair and the co-chair of the access working group and uh, propose some elements uh, of uh, gender analysis that could be collected in a systematic manner so that we can uh, have an evidence-based approach. On our side at OCHA, we also have a gender uh, focal point who recently like um, advise us also to include that. So actually from OCHA headquarters, there will be more guidance on including gender aspects and analysis in the access working group. And this should be released early next year. So your question was really topical. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie. Before giving the floor to uh, other participants, I, I will read the question in the chat. Uh, do you think that some organizations are more successful in accessing such as ICRC? And if so, what can UN do to improve? So uh, any volunteer? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe Ramsey or David. David, over to you. Hi, thank you. Um, I think there's definitely. I think it's it's very contextualized, right? So I think there is definitely certain actors who have um, better access than others. In my case, I am I am the biggest fan of the NGO forum, for example, in South Sudan because. Uh, the NGO forum obviously represents not the difference with the NGO forum is that it it represents NGO perspective, NGO experience, NGO demands, which uh, we all know are sometimes quite different than the UN experience. Um, and the NGO has been quite vocal and quite, let's say, political insensitive when it comes to saying things as as they are. Um, and when I think. Also, obviously, you need to keep in mind that if you do that, um, you need to take a risk. So the NGO, the NGO forum took a risk and they said things the way they were. And now they've generated tremendous respect towards them. So now whenever we want to talk about access, we cannot talk about access without talking about the NGO forum. Like the NGO forum has to be present when we talk about, about access. So I think uh, there's that, that is definitely a, a thing. That is definitely something that happens. Um, is it a bad thing? Not necessarily. The, the The key is how do we use that or how do we benefit from that to the best of 
to, in order to, to achieve the best results. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Ashley, have you a bit um, made during your research and study this comparison between actors and uh, the factors that make some actors more like successful, if we can use the word, than others in accessing uh, affected population or how to reach area? Over to you. Sure, I mean, the humanitarian community system, whatever we want to call it, is incredibly diverse, right? And one of the things I've looked at in different pieces of my work are what gives different actors the capacity to negotiate access, whether it's their willingness to tolerate more risk, um, their ability to be frontline responders or support frontline responders and work in partnership with them. Um, and there are a couple of things we can talk about. We can talk about uh, funding modalities. Uh, having bilateral funding from donors uh, can, be, can complicate the way that you work, where you work and how you work in ways that having uh, public donations such as uh, MSF, uh, having the kinds of agreements with donors, basically no strings attached funding that ICRC has, <laughs> um, you know, they have complete freedom to decide as they wish in a way that I think a lot of the multinational NGOs uh, do not, for example. They might be funded by USIAD who earmarks funding for them to work in specific areas of interest. And that might be driven by political interest rather than humanitarian interest or to work on certain things or to package what they're working on, even when it's humanitarian, in a way that responds to those political constraints. Organizations like ICRC and MSF they have less pressures, we can say. Frontline responders and national NGOs are in the position, I think, of you know their presence, their links to community are what uh, enables them to access funding and to continue working. However, they often don't have core funding, which means they can't really invest in things like insurance, training for their staff, the right kinds of vehicles, equipment, um, the overheads that would help keep them safe or uh, help them to develop the analytical tools which would further safe efforts for access. So I, I think it's better at looking, you know, we, we tend to look at organizations and stereotype them or put them into boxes. It's more helpful to break down these capacities. Um, another capacity is, you know, the organization's core identity. Do they see themselves driving into conflict areas while others drive away, which I think is part of the ICRC's mentality, right? It's this idea that we should be there. We sh there is no excuse not to be talking to all belligerents in the conflict. We have a mandate within international law to do that. So I think there are these different building blocks that one can learn from. Not every organization can have all of them, but we have to kind of consider those and break those down when we're assessing who does what well and who complements others well. Thanks, Huda. Many thanks. Uh, excellent, Ashley. Um, colleagues, I think that uh, we have uh, also, I don't know if I pronounce your name correctly, Bordes. No? If you can unmute yourself if you want uh, to uh, intervene now. Yes, please unmute yourself. And we, we don't hear you. You are on mute. Can you unmute yourself? Yes. Bonjour, tout le monde. Bonjour. Hello, everyone. Je vais partager l'expérience qu'on est en train de vivre en Haïti dans ce forum. In Haiti, we are living some experience. And talking about access is talking exactly about what we are going through. It is good to mention tools and to have tools, especially in French to train partners and to have the help of uh, UN agencies to master these important stakes in the response of the humanitarian actors. I have a huge problem of access with my partners for two months. 
uh, an armed group is blocking some resources, we need a special infrastructure. You 80% of local organizations working are, are handled by women, led by women, and women in this community are taking risks to save children at night, for example. It is very important today not only to share experiences and to give best practices, but also to support technically and help with this new crisis. This story of access is really a priority. It's essential when we get calls during the night saying that we have found a child with a bullet in the head and women cannot always go and, and get them and bring them to the closer hospital. The armed groups, when they're very strong, there's a lot of confusion, uh, but when they're politically strong, and then in this case, humanitarian access seems impossible. Today, we really need to understand how to um, support this element of the chain and help communities to face these challenges. These women I'm talking about have left their own families sometimes. And we have other women who are in need. And this issue of access today, uh, theoretically, we're talking about it theoretically now, but it is a reality. Practically, it is crucial. It's not human. Some uh, don't have access to water, for example. And we also have cholera, the disease that came back in our country. It's uh, there was a, um, an alert warning this morning at nine to say uh, that we need to have a meeting with the protection team, and I know that I won't have any answers to give to my partners of this uh, subgroup. What we are living here in Haiti is urgent. This is really moving. Coming from uh, IT directly with the very concrete examples with, uh, with, with raising the voices of all these women who, uh, who couldn't even uh, raise their voice and, uh, uh, and explain all this uh, impact of access re restriction on the protection of these women and children. Thank you very much. And um, I think that uh, one of the of the calls um, is uh, about technical support and capacity building. And I see that Christelle uh, in the chat is sharing uh, uh, the statement that GPC uh, made on Haiti on the 18th of October. But uh, we, we need also to do more. And, um, and uh, when it comes to the, to the translation into French, to the available tools, it's also uh, well noted. And I think we need to do uh, much and more when it comes to uh, diversity of our tools in terms of language and um, and uh, proximity to the different communities and local community. Uh, any last comments before uh, turning to our colleague Julien for the closing remarks? Ashley, Sophie, David, Ramsey. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. Hola, there was a question in the chat, uh, just to uh, see if we can provide some feedback. Yes, to Ramsey, the please go ahead. Yeah, uh, there was a question about uh, our engaging the non-state armed group. Uh, there was a question related to that. And just to clarify that uh, according to the Nigerian law, there's nothing that prohibits humanitarian actors from engaging uh, directly with the non-state armed group. But, um, the issue we've had is um, the structure of the non-state armed group is much complex that uh, there is no uh, defined leadership that you can engage with as compared to what we have with the military. The military is 
structure in a way that uh, you can engage the leader, you know where you can meet them. But with the situation with the non-state armed groups, the guerrilla warfare, the, the tactics they are using, uh, there is it doesn't provide an opportunity or structure for us to engage them directly. And um, another important point is uh, to note is the ideology of uh, Boko Haram when it was established, their perception of a West, Westerners. So engaging them may further poor humanitarian actors at risk, you know, so... Those are some of the factors, uh, but there is no um, there is no legal justification for us not engaging them. But the, condu- the, the, the situation and the condition is not conducive for humanitarian actors to engage uh, the non-state armed group members. Thank you. Thank you, Ramsev. Thanks uh, to all your contribution and to the very active uh, participation from the participants. And I still see questions, but we reached the end of our webinar. And uh, I would like to turn to Julien uh, for uh, the closing remarks. Julien, can you please? Yes, I see you now. Over to Hi, you. Huda. I hope you can all hear me clearly. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. I have the pleasure to provide a few remarks at the end of this very fruitful discussion and rich week of the Global Protection Forum. While there's certainly still a long way to go, together and thanks to the joint efforts and good practices shared with us today and during the whole forum, the route towards achieving our common objectives hopefully appears less challenging and key actions needed clearer. We're trying to secure and sustain humanitarian access and space as key to contributing to effective protection of the persons we work with and for. And to better using access negotiations as an enabler and opportunity to strengthen the centrality of protection in our collective interventions and achieving collective protection outcomes. Access is essential to effective humanitarian action, but is not an end goal. It is rather a means to fulfill the broader goal of improving the humanitarian conditions of people in need of assistance and protection. There is no magic wand or a one size fits all approach. As David and Ramsey highlighted, protection, including the gender lens, is essential to providing better context analysis on the risks related to specific interventions and mitigating measures that should be put in place through engaging with local communities to enable access to essential services. Without it, we risk achieving access that does not protect. If population cannot access services or go back home safely, and we risk finding ourselves back to the well-fed dead scenarios of the 1990s. Ashley highlighted how access, presence, and proximity, or the lack thereof, is closely linked to the lack of attention to protection. We talked a bit about localization and how it provides opportunities to ensure access and operational continuity in many situations. Working with and through local actors and communities enhances proximity of the response, but it is unlikely to achieve protection and likely to increase risks for local partners, especially if it means international actors abandon the front lines to local actors, transfer risks, and if we fail to leverage our collective capacity, resources, and added values. Using opportunities of access for from non-protection actors, such as our food security colleagues, can also contribute to protection thanks to clear, safe protection observation, reporting, and referral guidelines to feed our collective protection monitoring and access to essential services. And our collective analysis particularly in areas hard to reach for protection actors. As Ramsey showed with the case of Nigeria, coordination and advocacy for access, SIM cord and protection are closely linked. We should continue to work on enhancing coordination of action across those forums. Using opportunities for protection advocacy in our access negotiations in our engagement with local authorities, leaders, armed actors and communities is not easy. Asli showed very eloquently that challenges, uh, that the challenges uh, the, the new variants bring to old problems actually may well be one of the most difficult, sensitive and challenging aspects of our humanitarian work. 
But if humanitarian work was easy, there would be no need for us all. As William Shimali, our former GPC coordinator, often told us, as protection actors in particular, but as humanitarians in general, we need to be, to be troublemakers, smart and enabling troublemakers, but troublemakers nonetheless, and not shy away from difficulties and challenges. I would like to propose a provoking thought as we discussed engaging access working groups to achieve access that protects. How about having OCHA and a protection actor or the protection cluster to co-chair the access working group in all operations systematically mm -hmm. to bring both expertise together on access and on protection. I hope that we can build upon this opportunity to put in practice all the shared good practices and learning from those who are advocating and negotiating every day on the front lines and in hard to reach areas to deliver services and protection for those who need it the most. For those of you who have never done so, I would strongly recommend reading the seminal report, Stay and Deliver, and its sequel, Presence and Proximity to Stay and Deliver five years on. With this, I would like to close our October 2022 forum. I can say with confidence that year after year, the Global Protection Forum has become a great event and platform for various actors from different sectors, regions, backgrounds, and expertise to come together not only to discuss policies and practices, but also to shift behavior in order to advance access that protects and the broader protection agenda. A special thanks to all the organizers of the forum, Marie and Emma, and a huge thank to PHAP and the production team who made this all possible. Julie, Nathalie, Marcus, and all the interpreters. Thank you to Huda for being such a great facilitator, to our panelists, and all of you for joining us today and this whole week. We've had a great participation in all the sessions uh, of the forum. The recording of the sessions and key background documents will be available on the GPC website soon. We look forward to future events and learning, engagement and collective action on access for protection, including our end of year event in December. More on this soon. With this, thank you all, good luck, Stay safe wherever you are, take care, and have a great weekend for those of you who can take some well-deserved rest. Goodbye.